Good morning. Welcome to To The Point. This past week, President Donald Trump delivered his first State of the Union address. It was received very much along party lines. But this morning, we're going to look at a few of those issues the president talked about, and we'll also get reaction. First, a very short reaction from one of our congressmen here in West Michigan, and then a Democratic response from a Flint lawmaker. First, some highlights from the president's State of the Union. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. From there to the podium, President Trump laid out his vision for the coming year and gave his assessment of the union. The state of our union is strong because our people are strong. In Detroit, I halted government mandates that crippled America's great, beautiful auto workers so that we can get Motor City revving its engines again. And that's what's happening. Many car companies are now building and expanding plants in the United States, something we haven't seen for decades. Chrysler is moving a major plant from Mexico to Michigan. Toyota and Mazda are opening up a plant in Alabama, a big one, and we haven't seen this in a long time. It's all coming back. Very soon, auto plants and other plants will be opening up all over our country. This is all news Americans are totally unaccustomed to hearing. For many years, companies and jobs were only leaving us. But now, they are roaring back. They're coming back. They want to be where the action is. They want to be in the United States of America. That's where they want to be. America has also finally turned the page on decades of unfair trade deals that sacrificed our prosperity and shipped away our companies, our jobs, and our wealth. Our nation has lost its wealth, but we're getting it back so fast. The era of economic surrender is totally over. From now on, we expect trading relationships to be fair and, very importantly, reciprocal. We will work to fix bad trade deals and negotiate new ones. And they'll be good ones, but they'll be fair. And we will protect American workers and American intellectual property through strong enforcement of our trade rules. As we rebuild our industries, it is also time to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. America is a nation of builders. We built the Empire State Building in just one year. Isn't it a disgrace that it can now take 10 years just to get a minor permit approved for the building of a simple road? I am asking both parties to come together to give us safe, fast, reliable, and modern infrastructure that our economy needs and our people deserve. Tonight, I'm calling on Congress to produce a bill that generates at least $1.5 trillion for the new infrastructure investment that our country so desperately needs. Every federal dollar should be leveraged by partnering with state and local governments and, where appropriate, tapping into private sector investment 
to permanently fix the infrastructure deficit, and we can do it. Any bill must also streamline the permitting and approval process, getting it down to no more than two years and perhaps even one. Together, we can reclaim our great building heritage. We will build gleaming new roads, bridges, highways, railways, and waterways all across our land. And we will do it with American heart, American hands, and American grit. We want every American to know the dignity of a hard day's work. We want every child to be safe in their home at night. And we want every citizen to be proud of this land that we all love so much. We can lift our citizens from welfare to work, from dependence to independence, and from poverty to prosperity. As As tax cuts create new jobs, let's invest in workforce development and let's invest in job training, which we need so badly. Let's open great vocational schools so our future workers can learn a craft and realize their full potential. And let's support working families by supporting paid family leave. As America regains its strength, opportunity must be extended to all citizens. That is why this year we will embark on reforming our prisons to help former inmates who have served their time, get a second chance at life. <laughs> Struggling communities, especially immigrant communities, will also be helped by immigration policies that focus on the best interests of American workers and American families. For decades, open borders have allowed drugs and gangs to pour into our most vulnerable communities. They've allowed millions of low-wage workers to compete for jobs and wages against the poorest Americans. Most tragically, they have caused the loss of many innocent lives. Tonight, I am calling on Congress to finally close the deadly loopholes that have allowed MS-13 and other criminal gangs to break into our country. We have proposed new legislation that will fix our immigration laws and support our ICE and Border Patrol agents. These are great people. These are great, great people that work so hard in the midst of such danger. The United States is a compassionate nation. We are proud that we do more than any other country anywhere in the world to help the needy, the struggling, and the underprivileged all over the world. But as President of the United States, my highest loyalty, my greatest compassion, my constant concern is for America's children, America's struggling workers, and America's forgotten communities. I want our youth to grow up, to achieve great things, I want our poor to have their chance to rise. So tonight, I am extending an open hand to work with members of both parties, Democrats and Republicans, to protect our citizens of every background, color, religion, and creed.
My duty and the sacred duty of every elected official in this chamber is to defend Americans, to protect their safety, their families, their communities, and their right to the American dream. Because Americans are dreamers, too. That, of course, is just a small portion of what the president had to say in almost an hour and a half of a State of the Union address. Afterwards, Congressman Bill Heisinger, joined by his special guest in the gallery, talked about his response to the president's speech. It was uh, disciplined, uh, well delivered. I thought it was uh, very emotional at many times, covered a tremendous amount of territory. I think, uh, according to my notes, 27 or 28 different issues and, and, uh, and areas that he touched on. Uh, you know, uh, lots of discussion about the economy and the tax cuts, and that's one of the reasons why Zach is here with me. Uh, that uh, that tax cuts uh, going to uh, real hardworking taxpayers is allowing Zach to take his uh, barbershop business and other businesses and expand them and give uh, employees uh, raises and hire new people. And, and that was why I chose to uh, have Zach join me today. As I said at the top of the show, how this speech was received depended very much along party lines. When we come back, a Democratic view of what the president had to say in his first State of the Union. Next to the point. Welcome back to To The Point. The President's State of the Union address has been the focus of a lot of conversation ever since he delivered it this past week. Earlier, we talked with Democratic Congressman Dan Kildee from Flint about his view of what the President had to say. Congressman, let's start by talking about your perception of the speech that President Trump gave during the State of the Union earlier this week. What was your takeaway as you sat there in the gallery? Well, you know, I, I was a, a bit frustrated. I think the president did use a calmer tone, at least in this presentation, than some of the more uh, bombastic tones that he occasionally defaults to. Of course, he was reading the speech. Um, I, was, I was concerned about some of the rhetoric. Uh, his characterization, for example, of immigrants was a, a rather negative characterization by using you know, gang, mem gang members from MS-13 to sort of be the placeholder for uh, immigrants, I think, um, is a fairly dangerous characterization. You know, we're a nation of immigrants. We celebrate immigrants. Um, virtually all of us here, with very few exceptions, came here as immigrants. And I think the tone uh, of that language uh, was difficult. I was also a bit frustrated with his, um, his uh, characterization of his infrastructure plan. You know, a year ago, he proposed a $1 trillion infrastructure plan. And, you know, supposedly this was a $1.5 trillion infrastructure plan that he proposes, but the details matter. It's only $200 billion of federal money. He expects state governments to reach into their empty coffers, local governments who are struggling to try to come up with the, ma the vast majority of the money that he would like to see us invest in infrastructure. That's not a federal infrastructure plan. That's a really modest federal matching grant for mostly state and federal money. That is just not going to get the job done. So on those two points, I think he missed the mark. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have my differences with President Trump, and I try to give him credit where credit is due. He raised an issue that's important to me, but the details really matter. Well, let's talk about the infrastructure for a moment because you talk about that federal part of the investment being pretty small, but is there, first of all, is there the money and is there will to spend more money if the president proposed, say, using half federal money? Yeah, I mean, those are two, the, the two biggest questions. Unfortunately, uh, many of the financial resources that we had been focusing our attention on as a source of, of a major infrastructure investment, the president used in order to provide uh, support for his tax program. I mean, he borrows uh, over $2 trillion for the tax cuts. Uh, he used the repatriation of offshore assets and earnings, which we had been focusing on in a bipartisan way as a source of federal support for an infrastructure plan. He used that for the tax bill. So he has painted us into a corner. 
he and you know and those who supported the tax legislation it makes it much more difficult for us to find the resources but here's the problem it doesn't matter because roads and bridges and rail systems and ports and water and sewer systems don't get better just because we ignore them or because we have an infrastructure program that we can sort of say we did and check the box and not actually do anything substantial that will improve those so we really don't have a choice we are going to pay one way or the other for failing infrastructure we're either going to pay with more situations like what we saw in flint or we're going to pay with you know significantly reduced productivity and the way, the way I choose to look at it, and look, you know, debt is a really uh, difficult issue in Washington, D.C. But the way I look at bond debt for infrastructure, which is the way I think we ought to approach this, is the way we look at our home mortgages. It's, an, it's, a, it's a debt, it's an obligation that's connected to a tangible asset that we can depend upon, as opposed to the kind of debt that... Congress just approved and the president supported, which is debt for cash. It was like a credit card debt, and that's what the tax bill turned into. Doing long-term debt, issuing long-term debt to make a major investment in infrastructure has an asset associated with it. It's more like a mortgage, not so much like credit card debt. And that's the approach that I think we're going to have to take, especially now that the president has essentially burned that cash in uh, the tax bill. Uh, you said that a couple of times, that they've been painted at a quarter, burned that cash. Uh, was the tax bill just a bad idea from your perspective? Yeah, it was not well done. I mean, the whole idea, even going back to when Dave Camp from Michigan was the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, the whole idea was to reduce rates. And I was on board with that, and especially to reduce corporate rates on small and medium-sized corporations. But to do that by broadening the base, by reducing some of those gimmicks in the tax code that allow many companies to pay very little tax, many individuals to pay very little tax despite what the high rates are. But they didn't do that. They brought the rates down, which obviously that's a good thing if we can support it, but they did not eliminate what we would call loopholes. So a company that used to have a 35% tax rate but would bring it down to say 16 or 17 percent because of the benefits built into the tax code now have a 21 percent tax rate but those benefits are still there they're going to be paying significantly lower rates and it's not even across the board small and medium-sized businesses will continue to pay a higher share of the total tax debt than companies that are multinational companies that you know that have all these uh, uh, tools available to them so it was a missed opportunity and I mean let's face it we we the federal government put 2.3 trillion dollars on the credit card to reduce taxes today now you know as I said before there are different forms that debt takes but but entering into massive debt in order to pay for essentially unpaid for tax cuts. It's just not responsible and it eliminates this opportunity to use those resources to do something that will have a long-term and, and permanent impact on our productivity and our, on our economy and that's infrastructure. And, and it's not like it's going to go away if we don't deal with it. So I, I was disappointed. When you talk about infrastructure, long term to be sure, short term is the continuing resolution that will expire this coming week and the promise that there would be something, at least a vote in the Senate, on DACA. From your perspective, are either of those things likely to happen? Well, we'll see. I mean, the, the president brought it up again last night. Uh, I think we've actually moved some distance on this issue of DACA. It wasn't that long ago that there were virtually only a handful of Republican members that were willing to do something about the Dreamers. And of course we know what the President's tone has been on immigration in general. Fast forward to just this last fall, we've made pretty significant progress. So the hope is, is that the progress that we've made, really largely driven by the American people, 
has to be translated into policy. Uh, but w w so we will see if the words that we hear uh, from the president translates to a real commitment on the issue of the budget. You know, look, Rick, I am just done with these short term kick the can down the road budgets. And we don't kick it very far. This will be the, this is the fourth time since October that we've had a temporary spending bill for the world's greatest democracy, the world's strongest economy that can't plan for more than a few weeks at a time for our military and military readiness, for, you know, for all the grants that we use to support, say, policing or infrastructure, as, as, as much as that is, for medical research that's taking place, important research that's going on, for planning around health care. The idea that we have a budget uh, for a few weeks at a time is just an embarrassment. And we, we need a long-term budget. And that's where the focus ought to be. Not on kicking the can down the road yet again, which it looks like they're going to likely propose. I'm just done with that. That's no way to run uh, any kind of an organization, a corner drugstore, let alone the world's greatest economy. Congressman, just a few minutes left. I asked you a little less than a year ago if we had entered a post-cooperation world where Republicans will not vote for a Democratic president proposal and Democrats won't vote for a Republican president's proposal. Is that where we are? Well, it sure feels like that. But, you know, there's, there's actually much more cooperation that takes place between members of Congress. And I actually think that the, that the way Washington evolved, has evolved, it's the wrong frame. The chief executive, no matter who the president happens to be, has constitutional authority. The Congress has its responsibilities. We ought to legislate. And we ought to legislate notwithstanding the occasional tweets or speeches or rants that a president might make, no matter who the president is. And we should send that legislation to the president's desk. The president then has a choice, sign it or not sign it. But what we've seen just in the last few months, and you know, fair, to be fair, this is true uh, on both sides of the aisle, is that we include the president in the legislative process as if we take orders from him. I don't work for him. I work for the people of the 5th District of Michigan. And what I'd like to be able to do is sit across the table from members of Congress from other districts, figure out where we can find common ground, put legislation together, try to solve these big problems. We can talk to one another. We have long-standing relationships with one another. And then send those bills to the president's desk. Then he has a choice. Sign them or veto them. That's the legislative process. And unless we get back to that and, 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 and get away from this idea that we can't even initiate an idea until the president gives his blessing we are not living up to the, uh, to the oath that we swore to uphold the Constitution and perform our duties that are prescribed in it. And, and that, to me, is what, what Congress ought to be focusing its attention on. The question is now, will any of the action items the president talked about in his speech this past week actually get traction? That will depend very much on his ability to build a coalition of Republicans and Democrats. We're back with a final thought to the point. So the State of the Union is behind us. In front of us, another looming budget crisis. The continuing resolution will run out this coming week, and a vote on DACA was promised before Democrats said they would get on board for any other budget conversation. Will all of that happen in time, or is there another government shutdown looming? That's one of the things I'll be watching this week as we continue to cover what's going on in Washington and in Lansing every Sunday morning, right here at 10 o'clock for To The Point.